the main interest of our lab in the past has been closer to P53. So now in the last two years when we were asked to move to be among the first to set up this molecular medicine area at the Regina Elena Cancer Institute, we were asked to be more translational and to contribute in some way with the support of the technology to stratify better our patients recruit at the institute on a way to classify better for the tumors which the pathological classification is still poor and also with the idea to contribute to the therapy on a way to validate already known molecular targets or to identify new molecular targets through which new molecules can be designed. So now most of our questions start from what we can learn by profiling and by looking at the surgical cancer specimens. So we start making the picture of these uh, uh, cancer specimens and from there on we move back to the uh, cell culture to try to identify the molecular mechanism or to validate some of the uh, molecular information we can get by this profiling. And of course, when you start this type of question, one critical question relates to the material that you can analyze. And here you have always to make some choice. Of course, if the material is embedded the material, it's useful because you can use this retrospective material and get most a lot of information, clinical information, that then can be very useful in terms of stratification. But the material is there, you have to evaluate the quality of that material and this is what you can do. You cannot modify much these samples. If you look at the, uh, let's say, prospective studies, of course you can decide with the clinicians, with the surgical, which type of material you want to get from them, which peculiarity of material. But then you will have very few information and you need to wait hopefully years for some tumors, one, two, three years to get all the clinical information. So at the time that we started, a couple of years ago, we decided to focus on microRNA for two reasons. One is a practical reason because, uh, as you know, being small RNAs, even if the RNA, the total RNA that you can get from these samples is degraded and you cannot subject it to gene expression profile, this is still a useful material for profiling microRNA. And second, because these microRNA are expected to be powerful biomarker, at least for the tissue specificity and also for the reduced number of these emerges to be very strong. So we approach the problem to contribute to the stratification of our patients by looking at profiling of microRNA. I don't know inside to the details because all of you know even better than me, so microRNA and cancer is different relation, depends which is the target and which is if the microRNA is down-regulated, is over-expressed with target proteins that are involved in oncogenesis of target proteins that are involved in oncosuppressor. So they can serve either as oncogen or tumor suppressor, depend how they are modulated and depend on which target. <coughs> of course, the level of complexity compared to gene expression profile is initially reduced because today we are still dealing almost to 1,000 microRNA. But then once we look at the potential imputative target of the microRNA, we are going to meet thousands of the putative genes and target that can be modulated. So even if the first level of complexity looks simpler, then when we go inside the characterization, the complexity became again very high. So another choice that we made at that time was which type of platform we are going to use to profile. And here is still again an open issue. We focus on the platform of Agilent at that time because from our initial information and sharing information with other groups, we got the idea that the profiling by this platform uh, was rather robust in terms of the validation of the profile that you can get from the platform. And today that we have profiled, I would say, more than 1,000 samples from different projects, we believe that this is really a robust platform. We can validate, as you will see along my presentation, most of the data that we get by real-time PCR or by complementary analysis. And also getting the feeling with the other labs. 
for what is already known and for what is spotted, of course, on the, the Agilent chip. And if I recall well, uh, the latest version include 906 microRNA. This is a quite robust platform. So what do we receive are ah, samples, fresh samples that directly we can receive by the surgical rooms, or embed the paraffinated samples. And always we try to compare something that we believe it is original and can provide us with information. We have three types of samples in some type of tumors. We have normal peritumoral and tumoral, and sometimes we have only tumor and, and, and normal. Depends how the collection is organized and which are the questions that we are looking for. So another critical issue to approach this uh, translational problem is, is to set up a sort of a multidisciplinary research team. And along these two years, we have worked to pull together different competence. So now we are focusing on this uh, head and neck project where we have the possibility to screen uh, three different types of tissue. So we have tumoral, normal and peritumoral from the same patients. So it is critical, of course, the role of the uh, head and neck surgery. Then, of course, uh, critical is the role of the Department of Pathology, because from there we are going to get all the histological future of the patients. So we need calculation and power of the study numbers, and of course we need also in all these tumors, which is the impact of all uh, etiology, where the patients were selected, all the information that we can get from the epidemiology. And last but not least, and I would say maybe the most important, is the help of a bioinformatics, who has to take all this amount of data and stratify according to the clinical and pathological future to come up with some conclusion that can be evaluated. So as you see, most of our project have one person of our lab, in this case Federica, and one bioinformatician from the Eitan Domani's lab at the Weizmann Institute, and they both share the responsibility of the project. So why head and neck? So first of all, it's one of the most uh, frequent tumors. It's a rather heterogeneous tumors in terms that uh, can occur in different parts of our uh, uh, organism. So there are larynx, uh, pharynx, uh, cavi oral cavity, so many issues. The problem related to this uh, type of cancer is that uh, the histological types of these tumors is mainly one. They most of these tumors are spinocellular carcinoma but the response and the aggressiveness of these tumors is rather different. For instance, the tumors that are raised in the pharynx are more and more aggressive than those raising in the larynx or raising in the oral cavity. Some are under the infection of HPV, around 20%. Most are HPV negative. And this is uh, what is today proposed as molecular events that underline. Critical role is played by the P53 mutation that almost in Italy, at least in Europe, ranks in between 35 and 45 percent. And in the characterization of our sample, we go into the sequence of P53 mutation and we get a, a reasonable fraction of P53 mutated tumors. Some reports say that the P53 mutation is a late event in this process of carcinogenesis. Some say that it is an early event. Honestly, by screening our cohort of samples, around 100 samples, we get the information that most of the P53 mutation, I would say all the P53 mutation, we get only in the tumoral sample, never in the normal, never in the peritumoral sample. So our assumption from our data that seems to be a late event and not an early event. So which are the features of our patients? Here, of course, there are all the information that uh, are get from the pathology and some information that came from the clinicians. But what I want to stress is that from these uh, three samples, the samples that is uh, tumoral samples and the normal samples are histologically proven. So not only taken by the surgery, but also confirmed by the pathologist. While the peritumoral samples is not proven histologically, it is macroscopically taken by the surgery at one centimeter from the lesion. 
This says that, of course, this samples that is always uh, difficult to evaluate miss one of the criteria that is the histologically proven. For our decision, we have included only patients that have not been treated with any type of drug. So these are sample direct surgery in a way to exclude some of other additional int that, of course, could impinge in our profiling. And this is uh, one of the expression matrices we got, and as you can see, the peritumoral and the, normal, and the normal samples in terms of expression of microRNA seems more similar when they are compared to the tumoral samples. And here is in a more detailed way what characterizes the normal versus the tumor samples versus the normal samples and the tumors versus the peritumors. Because, of course, there are different questions that we can take out from this information. So if we compare normal versus tumoral samples, of course, we are going to look at which are the modification that impinge on the tumoral samples. But if now we compare normal versus peritumoral, we can get information of what could be potentially early events. There is a, a big debate of what is the role of the peritumoral in impinging on the tumoral tissue. So there, is, there are already events that then will be appeared and stressed in the tumors in the peritumoral, or from the peritumoral we can get information on a way how they control the tumors and how they instruct the tumors to be more aggressive. And later I will present some of this information. Of course, we have a collection of this uh, microRNA that came, and of course these are all the analysis that our bioinformatics uh, have performed. What we <coughs> have looked at with particular interest are those group of microRNA that are already modulated in the peritumoral. If the question that we want to push is the question which are the early markers that could help us to say, look, if this patient has already a modulation of this microRNA, maybe is more predisposed to develop an adenic tumor, so, or if it is exposed to the same agents to the others. Of course, the next round of that came from this is the validation. And most of these microRNA are validated by using, of course, the same uh, RNA that we develop by real-time PCR. And in general, in most of our project, always we were able to get 80, 90% of reproducibility in this analysis by real-time PCR. Of course, you can use this large amount of data and ask different questions. So here, for instance, we focus on a way to verify if there are a group of microRNA that differentiate these tumors, the three main type of tumors that are in the head and neck. Why we focus on this? Because as you can see from the survival, this is the survival applied to our patients, but you can extend on the patients that are in the literature, the pharynx, are those that have really the worst prognosis compared to the larynx and to the oral cavity. So it maybe could be important to identify specific microRNA that are modulating the pharynx compared to the oral cavity and comparing to the larynx. If you want to understand why these tumors are more aggressive despite the histological type is rather similar to the oral cavity and to the larynx. So the other possibility is also to look at what are the most important agents that induce the insurgence of head and neck tumors. And one surely is the HPV. We know, of course, of these samples which are HPV positive, which are HPV negative, and we are in progress of characterizing which type of HPV is involved. But already we were able to come up with some of this information, some of this group of microRNA that discriminate the HPV positive and HPV negative. And again, going inside into this analysis, we can learn some information. So there are microRNAs, and here is the 557, 
that is, mo that is modulated differently between HPV positive and HPV negative, but this occurs independently from the type of the samples we are looking for, independently from if it's a peritumoral tumor. Saying that this is a typical from HPV, but does not have any influence on the transformation. Then when we can compare tumoral versus peritumoral or versus normal, so we can get a signature of macular RNA that in some way could contribute to the late events because it is present only in the tumors and is not present in the peritumoral in the normal samples. And this is different. So it is present already in the peritumoral and is not present in the tumoral. So again, suggest that this group of macular RNA can maybe control the early events that uh, are related to the HPV-dependent <coughs> tumorigenesis in these samples. So this is one way to look at this uh, data and analyze. So another possibility is to look uh, at through the assembling or through the grouping of this macroRNA on unsupervised way, we can try to take out a subgroup of the patients. This is a very critical question because if you imagine that these patients may be need to be treated with a specific tailored therapy, it's important to know what are the molecular features. So here, by giving unsupervised analysis and asking just for how macroRNA group unsupervised and see which are the patients, you can see that we can get a different group of macroRNA that are correlated. Some of these impinge on the recurrence of these patients. So and this, this gives the idea, at least for this analysis, for macroRNA, that inside the population you can get different population with a specific signature. Some of these signatures, as you can see, uh, impact on some specific future that uh, are present in these patients. And give the idea how complex is the issue and how tailored the therapy needs to be. And most of the success of the therapy, in my opinion, depends on how we'll be able to closely know and characterize the tumors and design a specific set of therapy. So another element is the tobacco that is involved as the alcohol, as the HPV, are the most important inducer of these uh, tumors. And you can see here, we identify a clear-cut macroRNA 141 that is shown also in other types of tumors that uh, is highly expressed in, uh, in tumors and it impinges severely in the survival of these patients. And this is one macroRNA that we are trying to understand and characterize from the molecular. And of course, once you have this information, there are many programs that allow you to identify putative target gene, putative target of this macroRNA, and this, for instance, is the list of the 141. And there are many proteins that can be interesting and can be analyzed. The other possibility is to get more information. This is in silico and predicted, but if you have the possibility to combine the analysis of macroRNA with the gene expression profile on the same samples, whenever the quality of the RNA allow you to look into these samples, of course, the, you can get a more reasonable and more robust prediction of target site because you can combine. So these are the gene expression profile we did in 15 out of the 66 samples of that we initially profiled. And as you can see, also the gene expression profile gives very distinct and robust signature that differentiate normals versus tumor tissue, peritumoral versus tumor tissue, and surprisingly, but really interesting, normal tissues versus peritumoral tissues. So now we are in progress with the bioinformatics to cross the data of the macroRNA with this gene expression profile and get the feeling of what could be uh, the pathways that are involved in the modulation that are target of this macroRNA and see the, whether these that are the enrichment of the pathway according to the gene expression will be more robust and stronger if we can combine also with the level uh, uh, that is upstream in the regulation of this gene expression which could be macroRNAs. Another possibility, again, 
that needs to be validated, but if you have uh, data for mRNA expression through peculiar uh, bioinformatic tools, you can predict and build what could be the alteration, the genetic alteration that are present in those tumors. And this is one example that uh, Noah did for these uh, samples, where he reduced the number of samples that is distributed in pharynx, oral cavity, and larynx. Some of these alterations that are positioned in some specific chromosome have been already published, and some are novel. So this is an experiment rather critical for us if we want to approach the problem of the sequencing the genome of some of these samples and validate whether these alterations are really present to have a comprehensive view of what can be the profiling of these tumors. And again, validating a big number, of course, of samples, some of these uh, critical uh, alteration and we are interested to look for genetic alteration in the region that control macroRNA expression of course that is a small window of what will be the complexity that is there. So another <laughs> rather advanced project that originally was the first project we start was to look at the comparison between peritumoral and tumoral tissues in breast tissue. This was performed by Francesca in collaboration with Noah and again, there was also a peculiar reason here in choosing these tumors because it's the most known study, the solid tumors. And of course, once you start an approach, you need to compare your data and to share your data with others that are in relation with other people. And this is surely the most suitable tumors. This was originally the group of patients that we analyzed, representing the three most predominant type of breast tumors. Just for all our knowledge, we have to keep that in mind that breast tumors are 18 different types of breast tumors. And here we are looking the most representative window, but still a window of a more general pathology. And again, when we profiled these samples, we came up with specific expression matrix for DR2 versus the basal-like versus the luminal expression. And as expected, we got macroRNA that were down-regulated. The difference looks quite robust, at least in this R2 and this buffer-like. Yeah, there is a strong difference, and I'm sure this difference can be increased if, even if we distribute this between luminal A and luminal B. Yeah, is are considered like a common pool. So, once you are in the picture like this, you have different way to, to follow. First of all, you are interested to validate. Being a small number of the samples that we analyze, we needed to enlarge this number of samples. You can do on two ways. To look at already what exists in the literature and share with other large cohort of the samples and see if in that cohort you can do. And this was what happens in this collaborative manuscript in which the group of Yossi are then asked for macroRNA that were down-regulated in response to EGF. So EGF down-regulates macroRNA and, and uh, release oncogenic activities and he screened this analysis by using the court of Anneliese Borensen and asked us if he could look on the comparison between peritumoral and tumoral samples. And from his signature that was composed of 23 macroRNA, he was able to catch 19 macroRNA that differentiate selectively between peritumoral and tumoral. And give him, of course, a strong support to his idea that this molecular event instigated by EGF were specifically from the tumor samples and not, did not occur in the peritumoral samples. So the other possibility is to look at additional samples, to uh, collect from our institute additional samples, especially for this, uh, this group that were uh, uh, few at the beginning of our analysis. And then, and then it was we did, we collected additional samples and we reinforced the idea and confirmed further this result. And the other issue is where to go to look for the signature that differentiate each type of tumors or to try to combine the information. 
So our choice was that of to look for the macroRNA that were modulated and that were common to the three uh, type of tumors. So we focused on these three that were upregulated on these two that were downregulated. The idea why we did uh, this uh, choice is that we believe that this <coughs> macroRNA may control early events in the transformation of the breast that are independently from the type of the tumors, at least in our group of patients. So here yeah, is the real-time PCR validation and also that was done in the first court and this was done also in the second independent court of breast cancer samples and the information were confirmed even the disease are paraffin embedded samples and these are freshly characterized samples. And then again the bioinformatics went to it and look what, what were the relation and the correlation between uh, these uh, five macroRNA and some of the future of these samples. And we found the correlation with the T, with the tumor sides of these patients. And this uh, for some way suggest that if we believe that tumor sides is involved in proliferation, uh, other issues, but very general uh, uh, issues that characterize originally many tumors and different tumors and we focus of course uh, of some of these experiments back into cell culture. Here I show you some of the data with the two that were over expressed, the 10 B star and the 139 and when we over express in different breast cancer cell lines, these are MDA but similar results we got also in MCF7, we could see that the 139 over expression was almost uh, an effect in knowing while the 10B star was rather efficient in promoting apoptosis, in, in inhibiting proliferation, and in uh, promoting sub G1 phase, and also we check. So it reasonably suggests that if now we over express this 10B star, that is one of the two strands of the locus that includes also the 10B, that was originally shown to be very. Uh, very important in the spreading of metastasis in breast tumors. So of course we check what we can check in cell culture that is easier. So we say that this 10B star impairs the migration of MGF10 cells, uh, let's say close to normal cells, not normal breast cells, that if you induce with AGF they migrate. So now we can show that impair and also impair transformation is colony of target formation. And then of course we try to understand what could be the mechanism that determines this down regulation of uh, um, 10B star. And by MDIP we were able to show that this uh, uh, locus is uh, hypermethylated in tumors, it's not hypermethylated in the peritumoral and also, we use uh, some normal tissue, not from the same patients, but from people that were uh, uh, subjected to mammoplastic, reductive mammoplastic, in which most were for aesthetic reasons or for other reasons. So the tissue is there, uh, and it's uh, what we call a non-tumoral tissue. And as you can see, there is uh, hypermethylation of this locus, and once we try to release this hypermethylation, again, backing in cells by using 5-sadatin. And when we look to both the precursor and the mature macroRNA expression, we could get the feeling that we can revert this hypermethylation. And that this is a critical event that at least seems to control the hypermethylation the, the, and determine the down regulation of this macroRNA. So again, the other issue is to go into and look which are the putative target of the 10B star with a special focus on the regulation of the cell cycle genes. Because we build our hypothesis that this could impinge on proliferation. So and again, the bioinformatics helped us to identify potential targets that are co closely correlated. And this PILK1, BAB1, and CCNA2 look to be correlated. Unfortunately, we could not correlate at the level of the protein, so this correlation was done at the level of the RNA expression. Uh, uh, but still, we were able, by overexpressing the 10B star, to get the 
uh, modulation of this target has appeared in different cell lines and again give the idea that uh, uh, as you see here, the transcript of PRK1, this was done in different patients that were analyzed. Not all in cell culture, but this picture could be also reproduced at the level of the transcript in the patients. And the experiments are in progress at our pathology department to evaluate by immunohistochemistry what is the expression of these uh, 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 targets, uh, putative targets of this 10 B star. For some, Francesca did. Uh, a step further and try to verify by looking at the impact that this macRNA can have on the 3 UTR of BAB1. Additional experiments improve strongly that this, at least for this one, can be a direct target of this 10B star. And this is where we are with this project, moving uh, from Again, the analysis from a question that we started from sample patients, we go into the detail of putative targets and how this, the molecular mechanism of this putative card how they con can contribute and explain why this macRNA is downregulated, is locus is hypermethylated, what could be the consequence. Uh, we cannot do, of course, in tumor samples, only staining and radar. Uh, stable analysis, but we can perform uh, some analysis in the cell culture. So another project that intriguing us very much is to compare primitive tumors versus metastasis. And here the question was, the primitive tumors are lung cancer, which gives a different type of metastasis. We focus on brain metastasis and uh, the number, and again, the uh, team that are working on this one. So the number of the patient is still low, but I want to say that it's difficult to identify lung patients that give single metastasis at the brain, because the brain metastasis is surgery only if it's a single metastasis. If it's more than one, there is no way to surgery. So it's a, a small group of patients. We have more metastasis. That's because sometimes the patients is initially surgered for brain tumors and then when the pathology analyzed the sample realized that it's not a brain tumor but it's a metastasis from a primary tumor that is everywhere <coughs> and maybe is, has been identified only after the identification of brain tumors. That explains why we have more metastasis. We are really at the initial of this project but what surprised us that the expression for this macRNA of the primary tumors is rather different from the metastasis. And this was unexpected. And when we looked at this macRNA, we realized that most of this macRNA are also highly expressed in the normal uh, uh, neuronal tissues. So this, of course, opened us the question, maybe our sample were infiltrated by normal tissue. And what we are saying is, no one would say an artifact, but similar like this. So we stress our pathologies as well as our surgery. So we did some other control. And also by looking at the expression, there is a rather significant difference. So these are upregulated compared to the primary tumors, but are less and less expressed on what are expressed in normal brain. Because we, also, we had also uh, normal tissue from brain, we could do this comparison. So it seems that this group of macRNA that is upregulated compared to the primary tumors are rather similar to those of the uh, normal neuronal tissue, but are less and less expressed. Very preliminary suggestion seems to say that these primary tumors, once they get into the brain, assume a feature that is more similar to the neuronal tissue than don't the, the primary tissue. And it, of course, has many implications on what can be the treatment of this uh, brain metastasis from primary tumors in the lung. <coughs> so another possibility is to use macRNA in terms of prediction and to see if they are very, very early markers. So to do this, of course, we need some specific collection of samples. And this came from this audit court that uh, is present at the National Institute in Milan. 
in which they collect 11,000 women uh, almost 17, 20 years before they develop breast tumors. So they collect blood, sera and urines of all these healthy women and follow for almost 20 years. And then, of course, along these years, some develop, some did not develop any tumors. So there are limitations, of course, in these samples. So because the analysis we are performing, that we perform mostly is in Buffy coat. So we are looking at profile of expression in granulocyte mainly, and then we have to compare to the samples, to the tumor samples. But in my opinion, at least, look at to be a very original court. So when we approach this problem, and by calculation we profile 648 Buffy codes, which 302 were women that develop breast tumors out of these 11,000, and 324 were no cases, control subject, that were matched to this one for age, for all this uh, uh, information that they have, menopausal status, uh, all, all the hormones, all this information were matched. Age, uh, uh, type of diet, all these stuff were matched in a way that could be really control subject. And again, part 33% of these 648 samples were blind on a way to use in the bioinformatic analysis to match with the result that we could come. So I don't want to go into all these details. Of course, these are all the group of patients that are present in our analysis. The analysis is really at the beginning. And uh, what only I want to stress that at the moment our bioinformatics that have started to analyze this <coughs> complex analysis have been able in an unsupervised way to identify specific signature, we can say, that differentiate between the pre- and the post-menopausal women that were collected in these studies. This is not an information that at the moment impinge on cancer, that what we were looking was cancer prediction. So, but at least gives us the feeling that already in the blood there can exist the difference that allow us to differentiate the group of patients. Further analysis and, oh, and further work needs to be going to it. We now hope to get macroRNA from SERA of these women and to combine the analysis of the macroRNA from the SERA to those from the Buffy coat and see if there we can get the information. And we can evaluate potentially macroRNA that were modulated uh, at least 20 years before that women developed the tumor. So this for what we are going, uh, we have done and we are in progress with some of the problems. Then I want to move to another issue in which again the macroRNA seems to play a role. And this is the case in which we look at the, at the metformin that is used initially for treating diabetic patients and now is becoming a very important drug because of controlled metabolism. And as all of you know, metabolism now is a key feature of a cancer cell and is arousing and attracting a lot of attention. So why we were interested in looking at the metformin? The question is again based on clinical uh, evidence. So there are many evidence that people, diabetic people treated with metformin are protected in developing breast tumors. Mainly the evidence are for the breast tumors, but there are evidence also for other tumors. This in some way suggests that maybe this, uh, let's say, metabolic drug can promote uh, tumor protection. How can promote uh, tumor protection? So all the experiments we did with the metformin were focused to a concentration that at least in mouse and in cell culture did not promote any cytotoxic effects. We titrate to have some uh, the concentration that did not have any effect and that allow us to approach the problem at the metabolic level and see through a metabolomic approach if there was an effect there and the effect was very strong. So these are some of our in vivo experiments in which we uh, pre-treat 
the, the mouse with the metformin and then measure the tumor engraftment of breast tumors using this uh, SUM 159 cells and you see that the pretreatment with the metformin impinge severely the tumor volume of tumor engraftment. Then we compare metformin to doxorubicin that is used with many, uh, many treatments and again the effects of metformin can be comparable to, to doxorubicin in terms of tumor volume. And here is what you get if you stain some of this tumor in terms of the K67, the effects of metformin is rather robust. Okay, then we took these tumors and we analyzed from the metabolic point of view by doing HNMR footprinting analysis. So what appears is that the, some, the tumors treated with the metformin have a profile that looks rather different from both, from the vehicle treatment as well as from the doxorubicin treatment. So maybe the doxorubicin has some also metabolic effect as most of the drugs, but this is rather similar. And here if we go into the detail of the components, that represent a different fraction of enzymes that are involved in the metabolism, in the cancer metabolism. You say that the metformin severely impinges on the PC1 component that includes most of this glucose utilization, and while doxorubicin mainly impinge on the second and the third component. So this was the first evidence we got that metformin in some way in vivo modify the metabolism of these tumors and may represent a part of their activity. So then we back again to the cell culture. We use these cell lines that, was that we used for our in vivo experiment. We did the profile and we compare also with, I would say, normal uh, and breast cancer cells. And you see that the metformin induce modulation of macroRNAs. And then through different analysis, we went to predict the signal pathways and we focus on some specific uh, pathway and we came up with a signature of a macroRNA that we believe control critical components that are involved in these metabolic effects of metformin. So then again, to link how this metabolic effect could be linked to the macroRNA, we did the other experiment. So first and surprisingly, we found that metformin upregulated the expression of dicer, either at the level of protein, it seems at the transcription level. Then very initial information, we go into the promoter that is rather complex and try to understand which are the transcription factors. We focus on the E2F and it seems that the release from the promoter of E2F5 that is, plays an inhibitory role. So a sort of a balance between three members, some are activators and one is inhibitors, plays a critical role. And of course, we did also Dicer and also we did macroRNA upon Dicer and see that this effect, this uh, strong effect, uh, a difference that we see in terms of pattern the expression was almost uh, uh, impaired, severely impaired once we do Dicer, uh, use the cells in which Dicer was present. So then uh, again we took these cells, the Dicer, we did the metabolomic and again you see some of the effects that were realized were affected by metformin in the empty vector cells were turned off once Dicer expression was knocked down. Saying that this Dicer knockdown rescues some of this metabolic effect induced by metformin and this suggests that the modulation of macroRNA in some way is involved on this issue. And this we reproduce in different experiments, again in tumor engraftment, in colony forming essays, so in wounding LSLs, if you knock down the expression of Dicer, now this effect of metformin on different, uh, let's say, biological essays are severely impaired. So it suggests strongly that metformin exert part of its activity through the modulation of macroRNA. And then we focus on one of these macroRNA that was strongly induced by metformin, that is this MIR-33A, 
the case among its putative target CMIC, and again you see the expression of CMIC is down-regulated, and then we have some additional evidence that show that 33A use MIC as its own target. And then we did overexpression of the CMIC on a way to rescue in these cells, and again we subjected to metabolomic analysis. And we see that if downstream we now overexpress CMIC and restore this way, we can counteract in part the effects, mainly the effects that we got was on the uh, PC2 component and some on the PC1. Of course, this experiment being an overexpression needs to take in consideration that maybe the overexpression of MIC does de per se some activity that we cannot check, but we use like a complementary experiment to see that if now we impair this down regulation of the CMIC exerted by the metformin through MIR33A, we can rescue part of the, the, the phenotype. So this brings us to a model that includes some additional data that I have not presented, so metformin, but not only metformin, femformin and also ICAR. The TIGAR is a radar selective activator of IMP kinase. Femformin is like metformin less, but is more toxic. Activates IMP kinase. I am show you the result, but we have evidence biochemically activates IMP kinase. Metformin also induces DICER. This modulate macroRNA 33A that down-regulates CMIC. This is a way in which we have measured some of the anti-cancer effect that can also cure through the impairment of the metabolic effects that are exerted of metformin. Of course, this is only a piece of the way. Maybe IMP kinase impinge on this pathway on a completely uh, different way and through other pathways. And this is the one we are focusing on now. We are trying to identify and characterize better this activity at the level of the regulation of DICER uh, promoters. So there are many ways. There are also P53 bind sites. There are many, many sites that are interesting. We were attracted by E2F just because you have to start from some way. So we start from this E2F pathway. So here are the people in the lab, I will not go to all these collaborators, most of them are clinicians, some are from the pathology, the different hospitals that have provided us. So here in the lab, Francesca, this is the group that is focused on macroRNA, and then as in Francesca and Federica and Sara that has focused on the uh, ORDET project. These two surgeons, Isabetta, are those in charge for the affimetric analysis, and Julia take the responsibility for all the group. Then we have a small group of bioinformatics that already works, it's Andrea and Francesca. Here there is the group that has done some work on the cancer stem cell, but also on the metformin uh, part, and these are the people from the animal house, and all the work is close cooperation between molecular chemoprevention, the animal facility, and the translational. And the project of the metformin start from this uh, epidemiological and trial uh, that are ongoing with the metformin. Thank you.